going to be continuing our series in the uh, book of Mark this morning. For those of you who are first time here or you haven't been here for a while, um, we've launched into a, a new series in the book of Mark. And uh, just with the thought that what this world needs right now is um, to get back to, as particularly in the church, we need to get back to the basics of what this is all about. And, and the teachings of Jesus are so rich and so deep. Uh, I, I've just been confounded, actually, this week. I, I'm going to share with you a little bit about what God shared with me during my time of preparation here, but something that I, I never really knew before. So, or I guess I, I knew it, but I didn't really catch the linkage, and hopefully it'll bless your heart as we discover this together. So let's, uh, let's bow before the Lord before we start into his word today. And Lord, we just ask that you would, uh, you would bless your word. God, I know that you've got a special um, thing for each of us to hear from you. And God, this is your word, and I pray that, Father, that I would be faithful in, in bringing it forward to the folks so that they can learn and, and apply it to their lives. And Father, that they'd be built up strong. And Lord, that you would be glorified in what was said, what is said today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, back in the days of the early church, uh, there was a disease that was all over the place. And um, that disease was leprosy. Leprosy was a very common disease in the days of Jesus when he walked the earth. And it was this, an extremely contagious disease. Um, as a matter of fact, it's uh, been mentioned in the Bible more than, I think it's 40 times. And leprosy, for those of you who don't know, is a, a bacterial disease that affects the skin and mucous membranes uh, in a person. And um, it can have up to a 20-year incubation period in, in a person. And, and until the, the 1940s, there was no cure for this disease. Because there's no known cure for it, and it was such a terrible disfiguring disease, leprosy was greatly feared and was known as the living death. If a person contracted leprosy, um, they would immediately be removed from their home, and this is in the Israeli culture, and they would be banished from society. They couldn't work. They couldn't come into close physical contact with anybody that wasn't affected by the disease. No family, no friends. They couldn't even come close to anyone else that did not have this disease. They couldn't attend worship services. They couldn't enter marketplaces. You see, leprosy, if you contracted it, it uh, starts off as little red spots on the skin, and before long those spots get bigger, and they start to turn white and shiny and scaly in appearance. And, the spots soon spread all over your body, and the hair begins to fall out from the head and then even from your eyebrows. And things get worse. Your, your fingernails loosen and toenails become loose and they fall out. And fing fingers and toes get cuts on them and they don't heal properly and they rot and they fall off piece by piece. Gums shrink can't hold teeth anymore. So each tooth is lost. Leprosy eats away at the face until your nose is gone. And even the eyes sometimes rot. And the leper wastes away until eventually they die. See, lepers had problems, deep problems. They had problems with their social life, their financial life, and ultimately their spiritual lives. There was a stigma with being a leper that couldn't be shaken. And sadly, um, they were considered by many to be paying for sins that hate they had committed through the judgment of God. As such lepers, they were broken people. They were broken to the very core. Physically broken, but also spiritually and, and socially broken as well. And I, I'd like to take some time today 
to look into Jesus and what he did in the case of a leper that came to him. Now, scriptures tell us in Psalm 103, this is Psalm 103, 13 to 16. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on all who fear him, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are like dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and is gone, and its place remembers it no more. Jesus, being God in the flesh, had compassion on broken people. That's one common theme that you see throughout the New Testament recording of the life and work of Jesus Christ. He had compassion on people who were bound by the despair of diseases. But in the case of physical brokenness that we see in other places, there's spiritual, great spiritual lessons to be tied in with reading about the miracles of Christ on the physical level. So we continue this journey, and, and our text starts in Mark chapter 1, verse 40. So we'll read from verse 40 to 45. Mark 1, 40 to 45. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. May God bless the reading of his word. See, this leper, he... Uh, approached Jesus. He knew, based on his condition, that there was no natural help for him. The only help that he could get and the only hope that he had was to be healed from Almighty God. It was not the kind of condition you could just get over. Everyone there knew it. Once you got leprosy, it was a death sentence. So these lepers, they, they lived in isolation and um, it appears that the word of, about Jesus had circulated. Now, we, we started into the ministry of Jesus in uh, Galilee, and the word apparently had made it out into the leper colonies. And, and this particular man was desperate. He was desperate. And, um, you know, the people that would have been watching this would have been quite alarmed that this leper came running up towards Jesus. Um, and generally, those fears that people had of this disease were such that it overruled compassion that they would have. And if you touched a leper, uh, you would very likely come down with this disease. You know, in that day, there was actually a rule. It was actually a law, um, which was strictly adhered to. If you, were, if you were a leper, you understood that you were not to come within 50 paces of anyone that did not have the disease. If you were a leper and you tried to come closer, you were strictly dealt with. If you were a leper and someone started walking towards you that wasn't leprous and they started coming, closing that distance of 50 paces, by law you were supposed to call out, unclean, unclean. That's what you're supposed to do. It was understood that was the law. And in the Old Testament, there were you see, there, there were stories where, where leprosy uh, came on people who had done evil as the punishment of God. Actually, there's three instances in the Old Testament where that was the case. And because of these three examples uh, in the Old Testament scriptures, there were traditions that were established by the teachers of the law of that day and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those people that they made law not only with the law of Moses and, and the Bible, but they made their own traditional law as well. And they, and they, they kind of, com it was like a, a living commentary. And their living commentary of leprosy 
was that uh, because of these three examples in Scripture, they believed that all leprosy was solely as a result of God's judgment and was a direct punishment for a terrible sin that that person had committed. Therefore, they were the lowest of the lowest of the low. They weren't even considered, they were considered outcasts, complete outcasts. And this, you see, lepers deserved what they were receiving according to this traditional law. They deserved what they were receiving because God was pouring out his wrath upon them for something they had done. And that's why they were required by the Jewish law, legal authority there, in, in the religious authorities. That's why they were calling, they were required to call out unclean. Unclean. They were, in fact, actually crying out as understood by everyone around them. I am a sinner under judgment from God. Stay away from me. But the Old Testament never said that every case of leprosy was the result of something terrible a person had done. Never said that. It was not even inferred that. But the traditions of men were implemented and the religious systems were established and that was the boundary. It, it was an idea that came from traditions of men who projected ideas. The poor lepers. Those poor people. They couldn't ex escape the stigma of this. And the religious Men of that day were relentlessly brutal on the people who had this disease. So when this man approached Jesus, he was desperate. He didn't respect the 50 pace rule. He didn't listen to the instruction very well either that Christ gave him. But I think it's possible it says that Jesus was indignant. Now there's a couple of different translations. In one place it says he had compassion. I, I think Possibly what, what was being said here, okay, now there's two different Greek uh, texts um, that are drawn from. Some translations draw from one, some draw from the other. But the fact is, I believe Jesus was compassionate upon this leper, but it's possible that he was indignant by the whole system that had done this to this poor individual, where he came up to him and said, I am unclean. Can you make me clean? If you're willing, you can make me clean. See, this man had been told that he was the worst kind of sinner. Worst because God had judged him with this terrible disease. The fact that the teachers of the traditions of the law were wrong and were misinterpreting the Old Testament and we're misinterpreting God's heart for people. Jesus was not going to kowtow to the traditions that this man was unclean or that he was suffering from this condition as a direct result of some horrible sin he'd committed. He was going to kowtow to that. Jesus, in his compassion, he told the man that he was willing to make him clean. And he reached out across the law that was established by men and he touched the man. Do you understand? This is in full view of the religious leaders. It says you shall not touch them. You shall not come within 50 paces of them. This was law. Jesus had compassion on this man. And he reached across the boundary and he touched him. He was sending a strong spiritual message in this. To everyone watching, in a deeper sense, that all are corrupted by sin. And that means every single human being alive is corrupted by sin. But when they come and they are touched by the master, when they're touched by the master, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you've been, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when you reach out 
to the Lord and he lays his hand upon you, that sin is atoned for. You're set free by the power of the living God who has compassion on all that he has made. Does this make sense? Jesus healed this man. And he gave him a stern warning not to go tell everyone what had been done for him. And that's kind of perplexing to some people. But you see, Jesus, um, he, he had a mission to accomplish. And, and he wanted this man to go to the, he actually wanted this man to go to the temple and uh, present himself before the priests. Because the priests knew that leprosy was totally, it was totally, um, Un incurable to them and if he went to the to the temple and showed himself to the priest they would know that this man was touched by God and when he would have told them that Jesus of Nazareth who had healed him told him and came and asked him to go to the temple to fulfill the requirements of the law of Moses for cleansing they would know that he's not acting on his own authority but he's acting under the authority of, of God Almighty that's why he did that. But the man was so excited. He didn't listen that well. Maybe, you know, I don't know. If, if I had leprosy and I was going to die, and Jesus told me not to say anything, I'd be strongly tempted to just go, ah, I'm healed. This, this man from Galilee, he touched me, and I'm healed. There's no more leprosy. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Ah, because he had a death sentence over him. Not only was he cleansed from the disease, but he was cleansed from the social isolation. He could go and hug his mom and dad and his family. Ah, can you imagine how that would feel? So he didn't listen very well. And he went out and he disregarded what the Lord had said. And as a result, it says that Jesus couldn't even enter a town because the word spread around about him that he was doing this. And uh, he had to stay out of the towns because the mob was so great. Like everybody in the cities were coming to see him. And even out in the country. We see this later on in the miracle of the loaves and fish. That kind of set the stage for that, right? Where he fed the multitudes out in the, wilder out in the wilderness area. You know, that's kind of the setting the stage here. You know, it's very well that Jesus, you know, was aware that this leper wasn't going to listen. Right? Um, he knew that this guy had certain character flaws. You know, there's sometimes when we come and... And um, we, uh, I, I don't know, when I first came back to Christ, um, it was just like my slate was cleaned, my heart was cleaned out. And, you know, I, I, as a little guy, I was, I was a believer and everything, and I fell away from, I just got myself dirty in the pig pen for a while. How's that? Okay. And I needed to get washed off and cleaned up, and I came home to my father, and my father was there with his arms open wide. And he cleansed me, and he saved me. And when he did, when I came back to Christ, um, as, as a young man, when I came back to Christ, he cleaned me out, and it felt like someone took a fire hose in me and just went, Poof, just washed all the crud out. Here I was clean. The flowers were, were, were more colorful. The grass was greener. Everything was changed. And I'm like, how come I didn't see this before? I was so stupid. Why didn't I see this? I was raised with it. I'd seen it. I heard it, but I'd never seen it. In my spirit, the same way as I did at that moment, I was fresh and clean, and it felt so good to be clean. It felt so good, you know. And in my haste, I want to run out and tell everybody, hey, dude, you need to get saved. I don't want to get saved. Too bad, man. This is the way, you know. Repent, repent right now. Shake, 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 shake. Hey, let me go, let me go. You Okay, I wasn't always wise with how I approached people. And, you know, there's times where God tells us to do radical things, but, you know, like sometimes we, we act out an impulse. And God's saying, hey, hold, hold on a second here. I got another way of approaching this, but we're so, like, happy, like, I'm free! And then we just, like, tearing through town, tearing through our relatives. You know, God uses it, but I'm just saying Okay, this is kind of how I think the leper was in this case here. It may, makes sense, right? How, how he would have been. Jesus healed him, knowing the full well that he was going to do this. Okay, there's a spiritual 
No spiritual examples all the way through here. Well, <laughs> after this miracle was done, Jesus and his disciples, they continued on their way to Capernaum. And we read from chapter 2. Let's we'll start into chapter 2. A few days later, when Jesus entered again, Capernaum, Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Now, partly due to the word that was spread about the leper and also the word of others who had been healed because of the touch of the master, um, it, you know, he had set people free from demonic influence, possession. You know, there was all this happening. Jesus' fame grew. They were hungry. And you see here, it's like they gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, uh, a roof, the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the man on the mat he was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Interesting. Jesus could see into the hearts of the people. You know, they were all gathered here. They were hungry. They were hungry for the truth. They were hungry for the Messiah. They were hungry for hearing from God. Jesus continues building his spiritual message in this next pure miracle that he performed. Um, this man apparently was suffering from paralysis of some kind. And uh, we don't know. It doesn't say it was from birth or anything. Maybe he was a construction worker that fell off a building. Or maybe he's one of those guys that was building the roofs in those days that uh, they would lay mud over uh, wood on the roof, and that's how they constructed it. That that's why they were able to dig. Um, the Jews would go up onto the roof, and they would have their patio kind of up on top of the roof often. You still see that today in, in Israel, that kind of structure. So, but, you know, maybe the guy fell through a roof. We don't know. We don't know. It doesn't say how this guy got paralyzed. But we know that he had great support. A great support from friends or family that surrounded him. This miracle was done by the Lord to illustrate that he's not only the source of physical healing, but more important than physical healing, Jesus is the source of salvation from all the calamity that is brought upon the human race by sin. The miracle is all about spiritual healing. See, Jesus healed people, not just specifically for healing. Yes, he did it to ease suffering, for sure. No question about that. But primarily, he was interested in the spiritual lesson behind it because the grass withers, the flowers fade. All of us get sick at one point, and we fade away. Right? Physically, it's, this is just like you got maximum 100 years, right? Or, well, I shouldn't say that. Some people have relatives that are 102, 3, 4, you know, but you know what I mean. Like, you only have a limited time. So what Jesus is teaching here transcends time. It's not about just here in the physical. <laughs> this man and his friends had faith in the Lord to pursue him. Jesus recognized the faith of this crippled man and his friends who helped them, they helped him to come near him. He saw, this, he saw this faith from these, these people that had brought this, this, this paralytic man to him. And what did he say? He said, son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus knew this physical condition was an issue. But the deeper issue was a spiritual life that was broken because of sin. That was the deeper issue. This man was made completely whole at the spoken word of the Lord Jesus, completely whole. See, this man was not an outcast. He wasn't an outcast like the leper was. He had plenty of support. He had friends or family that were right beside him. As a matter of fact, they went in great, out of, out of great lengths to get their friend to the master. I 
The leper had nobody to help him. He was all by himself. This man was surrounded and supported. Yet Jesus didn't heal the leper outcast who thought he was unclean because of his disease by saying, your sins are forgiven. He didn't heal the leper that way, did he? He touched him. But in this case, the man who has all the support around him and is not an outcast and is not deemed unclean, Jesus heals him by saying, your sins are forgiven. Think about this. He's trying to say something. See, it wasn't just about the physical healing. In either case, it wasn't, with the leper or with this guy. There's times when we put people on hierarchical rungs of religious tradition, where we look at this man and say, this man is more worthy to receive God's grace than this man because this man's a dirty, rotten scoundrel, and this man here, he lives an honorable life in the community. And we measure people, and we give preferences. The fact of the matter is, my friends, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter your prestige in the community. It doesn't matter with your, whether you're alone or whether you have tons of family support around you. We're all the same before God. He has compassion on all. And everyone who comes to the Lord in the spirit and pursues the Lord and calls upon his name, the master is compassionate and will reach out and will touch that person and will heal them. You know, we're told in Isaiah 53 that he was, you know, he was beaten and bruised for our transgressions and pierced for our iniquities. You know, a lot of times that gets taken out of context. We, we talked about this in Bible study. People say, well, that means I can claim my physical healing. No, it doesn't. What that means is that that scripture refers to a person that's broken spiritually and separated from God for all of eternity and lost with no escape being brought into spiritual healing by God and salvation. There's times in our life, and, and we can learn some things from this lesson here. You know, I just want to divert to this little point here, um, where you have, the, uh, you have the ability to see someone who is suffering, someone that is broken down, beaten on the road of life, and they're crippled and they can't make it on their own. And God calls you to step in. Not because he has to, but he calls you to participate with him in the work of the gospel. To take the precious message of salvation and healing through Jesus. To bring that person to the master. Because it's not you that's going to save them. It's the master that does the healing. It's the master that does the saving. But you get to participate in God's good work by seeing the people out there that are broken down and beaten on the path of life. He calls you to take time to stop out of your schedule and pay attention to those people that are lost because Jesus loves them. And to load that person on your ride and to take them to where they need to be to get the healing touch that they need. That's Christianity, where it's supposed to be. We come to church sometimes to receive. Well, we receive well enough when we come because God is a good God and he touches us. I'm sure the disciples received greatly when they're in the master's presence. You receive greatly when you receive the the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, and the Holy Spirit comes inside of you. He comes into you. He dwells in you, and he gives you his word, and you feast on his word, and you worship him, and it's all good. It's all good, but it's not meant to be kept to yourself. It's something that's meant to be shared with others. We need to be aware of the brokenness around us and seek out those who need to see the Master 
who need to hear the master, who need to draw near to the master because he's the one that's the solution for their problem. Spiritually. Do we know people on the road of life that are too crippled to make it on their own? They can't see because the God of this world has blinded their eyes so they can't see. Right? But what does the Bible call you? You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Therefore shine your light before men that they may what? Not they may hear you just gabber and gabber. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It's practical. The gospel is practical. It involves both telling and doing. It's both. It has to be coupled together that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The gospel goes out through us because the Master has called us. He's called you. And you say, oh, I can't do that, Pastor. Hey, you know what? God's big enough that he can draw connections. You may have a little part to pay, play. Someone else is going to have another part to play. Do what you're called to do. You see a need, meet it. Period. That's God's calling on you. You want to say, oh, God, can I... Should I be doing this? Should I be helping that person that's destitute? If it's on your heart and God's put it in your, in your face and said, hey, there's a person with a need here, that's a good indication that God's calling you to step in because he wouldn't have put you there to be aware of that unless you, he had. Right? So pray. God, lead me. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lead me where you want to take me. See? These friends, noble, noble friends, took their friend to Jesus. They went so much as to, you know, have to work a little bit. They dug through the roof to lower him down. Do we know people that are too broken to find their own way? All of us do. That's why God puts you in their lives. Don't ever think that you don't have anything to say. Your life is a testimony. You've been saved by the blood of Jesus, by the strength that comes through the power of the risen Savior. And the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. And the same calling that he gave the original apostles and disciples is given to you as well. Don't be afraid. Be bold in the Lord. Trust in his name. And bring people to see him. And God will do the work of transforming that person. The master will touch that person. And that person will be healed. Uh, now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves. Why does this fellow talk like that? He asked this, he told this guy his sins were forgiven. He's blaspheming. Who can for sin forgive sins but God alone? Interesting, who can forgive sins but God alone? They're asking a decent question. Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. <laughs> he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Wow. The authority in the name of Jesus is real. And it continues today. It's not just something for the first century. Jesus demonstrated his power to them to establish his kingdom and to build his church and to establish the new covenant in his blood. He did that. But the same Lord and Savior here is alive right now at the right hand of the Father. And the same Lord has given his children 
the Holy Spirit to be with them forever. And that, my friends, is everyone who believes in the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ and confesses with their mouth that he is their Lord and Savior. If that is you, you have the spirit of the living God living inside of you. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. The same spirit by which Christ healed these people. There's life-giving power in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen? The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law held, held deeply to the traditions of their forefathers and the law of Moses, so much so that the traditions and the methods of doing these things became elevated above human needs. Sometimes the, the way we do things in church, does that become elevated above the heart connection that people are called to have with God? Sometimes it does, doesn't it? It's a natural thing. We like to have those parameters. God is the same God here in 100 Mile House, British Columbia, as he is in Zambia, as he is in uh, Seoul, Korea, Japan, even, you know, down in the States. Same God. Different cultures. Different ways of doing things. But the same Jesus. Let's not get hung up on the things that we have been handed to us as traditions of men and let that cause us to push people away because they don't quite fit in with our idea, right? The Pharisees and the scribes and teachers of Allah, they did that. They were religious and God's spirit resisted that. He resisted that. Jesus subverted the ritual boundaries of the Jews' religious system not so much by introducing something completely new to them, but by showing what was truly important to God. And what's truly important to God is the heart. That's what's important to him. There's always been sacred cows of religion that are based solely on tradition, rather than flowing from the heart of God. We need to be aware of the dangers associated with these things. We can develop cultural bias, I guess you could call it, and miss the point. The point isn't doing church. The point is being the church to the world that's lost without Jesus. And however we do that is based upon where we are standing. We may have to adjust our systems. We may have to adjust the things that we've held as sacred cows and let them go. That could be generationally. It could be uh, culturally. There's a whole lot of things to this. But Jesus has come to set people free. When Jesus came to establish his new covenant, he had to lay the groundwork by confirming the things that were being done that were out of sync with the heart of God. That's what this is when he did this with the Pharisees and the, and the teachers of the law. He was putting his finger on something that was out of sync with the heart of God. And it kind of goes back in history with the Jews. Um, in Amos chapter 5, 21 to 24, the Lord said this to those people who were out of sync with his heart. Right? He said this to them. I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like an ever-failing stream. See, there's things that are deemed as acts of worship to God and are not, and things that people don't realize are an act of worship to God that truly are. This morning, what we do here is really important. You know, and I, and I want to say our, our worship set this morning was beautiful and was exactly what God desired and was pleasing to him. <laughs> I believe that with all my heart. But God is most interested in how we hit the ground running out there. That's, that's where he, his call is. He's, worship, he's, he's worshipped not only with our singing and our time like this, but he's worshipped what does God consider as pure religion? What does he consider as pure religion? Pure religion is this, to rescue orphans and widows in their distress 
and to keep yourself from being polluted by the world. That's what God considers as pure worship, unadulterated worship. So let our hands lift in praise to the Lord and let our feet walk into the places that he leads us. And may we be the light and the salt that he's given to this world. Amen. Jesus, we come to you today as your children that have, many of us have, have surrendered our lives to you, Jesus, and, and you've touched us and you've healed us spiritually, you've brought life to us. For that, we're grateful. Lord, maybe there's people here that haven't taken that step yet. They've never really seen their fact, the fact that they need you even. They, they know they need something, but they maybe they don't know, know that they need you. And actually, what they really need is for you to touch them or to come near them and speak the word that they could be healed. And, and Lord, you've made provisions through the work that you did so long ago on the cross. Lord, we need your mercy. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, you can do that today and you can, you can be set free from the spiritual chains and the brokenness that's within you. And that, that cleansing, that, that washing that I talked to you about, that I experienced, can be yours. Why? Because God loves everyone equal. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, how you've blasphemed God's name or all of that. We're all sinners in need of grace from God. It's by grace that you are saved, my friend, not through your own works. You don't have to be good enough to come to Jesus. You're not. You're not good enough. Nobody is. But Jesus is good enough to call you and extend his touch to you and heal you and restore you. There's power in the Lord Jesus Christ today. So if you are needing to accept Jesus as your Savior, you need. That, it's a need. Don't delay. Don't put it off. You don't know if tomorrow is going to be your last day. Give Jesus your life today. And he'll fill you with his Holy Spirit. He'll cleanse you from the inside out. And yep, you know, things will change if you do that. Things will drop off. You've got to be willing to leave your old life behind and to follow him. He's going to call you. There's a cost to it. It's not like you just continue living the way you always have and then, well, all, you, all you've wanted in the past, you've got to let go and turn to the master and say, Lord, what do you want me to do now? See, when you do that, God will save you and you're on the path to a new life. But he'll give you the power in his Holy Spirit to be able to, to be the person that he desires you to be. Christian, today, if there's things that we've got our eyes off, off on, onto instead of the Lord and his mission and what he's wanting for us, I just challenge you today. Seek him. Seek him. And say, Lord, take my hands and let them be used for you. Take my feet to the places where you want them to go. Lord, even the lips that I have, and I don't have much to say, God, but what I say, Lord, may it be used of you. And teach me, God, so that I can be more like you and more able to, to make an impact. Help me to bring my friends and my family to you, because only you can touch them, Lord. I can't, but help me to facilitate that, Lord. I pray all these things. God bless these people today as they go home. And we're just going to close in song. Thank you, Lord. Amen.